It's my pleasure today to introduce uh, um, Jennifer Siegel to you, uh, an artist, architect, and designer uh, known for her work in creating the mobile home of the 21st century and who is the principal of the Los Angeles-based uh, firm Office of Mobile Design, uh, which is dedicated to the design and construction of ecologically sound, dramatic structures and architecture. Um, Jennifer's interest in the concepts of uh, portability and sustainability um, began uh, with a very practical application uh, and that also has some ancestral roots. Uh, I've come to learn that as a graduate student uh, at Los Angeles' uh, Southern California Institute of Architecture, uh, she in fact um, owned and operated a hot dog cart. Uh, uh, her father also, if I'm understanding it correctly, your grandfather, uh, operated a hot dog cart um, at, at Coney Island, uh, which I love, by the way. I, just the very idea of that is incredible to me. This was, I would assume, before the uh, ubiquitous presence of Nathans on Coney Island, which is not a good dog, by the way. Uh, not that I would know, necessarily. Um, she also spent some time in high school uh, studying in the Middle East and encountering, uh, among other cultures, uh, uh, the Bedouins of the Sinai Desert. Um, and one can deduct in all of this, I would argue, uh, an ongoing fascination uh, with uh, something like the perfection uh, of the concept of impermanence, which is, in essence, why I was really interested in bringing her here, the very idea of that. Uh, was fascinating to me, and your work is fascinating to me in that regard. Um, she earned a master's degree from SciArc in 1994 and was a 2003 Loeb Fellow at Harvard's Graduate School of Design. Uh, she has been an adjunct associate professor at USC. Uh, her innovative design sensibilities and expertise uh, and futuristic concepts of prefabricated structures and green buildings and technologies were recognized by the popular media uh, in 2003 when Esquire magazine named her uh, one of the design world's best and brightest uh, and the Architectural League of New York included her in the acclaimed Emerging Voices program. Um, please welcome Jennifer Siegel. Uh, thank you so much. I, I just have to say something about hot dogs. <laughs> uh, one time in Boston, because I had the cart in Boston as well, before I went to graduate school, uh, the Sausage King, we were in the territory of the Sausage King, as it turns out, which I don't think that was pre-Nathan's. I think they were competitors. And um, their vendor pulled a knife on us and said, you know, this is my territory and you have got to leave. And that's when I thought, oh man, this is not the, I don't have the stomach for this. I'm going to be an architect <laughs> instead. Uh, hang on, I just have to grab my coat. Okay. Anyway, I'm so pleased to be here. I don't often get to speak to a group of uh, super creative, talented, uh, individuals outside of the architecture world so it uh, and architects are very boring sometimes and dry so I, I actually uh, prefer the art world and um, have an incredible appreciation for industrial design and uh, materiality and hopefully some of this work will uh, you know show you those ideas tonight and thank you Michael and Ian and Ian for braving the, the airport today for picking me up. Uh, okay, here we go. Uh, the title of this talk tonight, it has a couple titles, but I'm gonna call it Generation Mobile, The Death of Distance. Anyone who lives in Los Angeles on some level is aware of issues of mobility. At the risk of restating the obvious, getting around requires vehicles. As a nomad and occasional uh, Angelino, I have been consumed with this question of what kind. Not only am I concerned with environmental consequences of automobility or dromology, a term coined by Paul Virilio, Virilio meaning the science of travel, but I'm equally interested in using design to affect social mobility. 
uh, I love this quote by Benjamin Bratton from his essay, I F iPhone City, where he says, sitting in traffic on the Los Angeles freeway, looking at my edits on this essay, I reminded of Joan Didion's revelation that this is the most authentic Angelino social experience. We are not going to any place, all lined up behind our windshields. We are already there. Uh, this is certainly a concept that applies to most American cities today as well, but in particular Los Angeles, where uh, I probably spend an hour every day going to to um, teach at USC every other day, and um, some of the best ideas, you know, come during that time. Um, I'm also interested in ideas uh, of alternative energies, and I'll show you some examples of this. And this is an example that uh, the um, uh, from sorry the MIT's Media Lab. Uh, which was called the city car, and it was really one of the very first ideas about, um, I'm probably, you're familiar with this, of a kind of alternative vehicle that, uh, or an autonomous vehicle that we're hearing so much about today uh, that could easily be picked up almost like a shopping cart and swipe your card, take it, and then reposition it um, in a small urban context. And they were looking at this for, uh, initially for Vietnam. In fact, you could say that my preoccupation with devising portable structures came out of my family's own economic history. My grandfather, this image on your left, uh, had a hot dog cart in Coney Island. And two generations later, while putting myself through graduate school at SciArc, I did as well. So it was not really a leap, but it was rather a logical move when I founded Office of Mobile Design in 1998 as a way to actively engage in designing non-permanently sited structures that move across and rest lightly upon the land. The image on your right is a live-work colony in downtown Los Angeles called The Brewery, where I spent about five years um, living up against a very active train yard. So, um, And when the trains would couple together, the whole building, which was just a corrugated metal shed, would essentially shake and would always startle clients. But it became just a uh, passe and sort of part of the work that we did and a kind of a reminder of what we were doing. So my work seeks to rethink and reestablish methods of building that contrast with the generic clutter that increasingly crowds our landscape. I'm inspired by San Elia's Futurist Manifesto. I share in his philosophy whoa, that, we, that we, quote, no longer believe in the monumental, the heavy, and static and have enriched our sensibilities with a taste for lightness, transience, and practicality. An image here, a uh, road between Jerusalem and Tel Aviv where you get an idea that there's uh, potential upheaval and uh, so this mobile gas station can easily be removed um, when necessary. This desire for the active mobile and everywhere dynamic that characterized the Italian futurist machine aesthetic infuses my work at OMD. Shown here is the rock climber whose dynamic form responds to the static rock face, or the parkour's efficient and quick ability to overcome obstacles. While architecture's purpose remains constant, providing inspiration and shelter from the natural elements and community among its inhabitants, Mobile and portable structures herald the dawn of the age of new nomadism. The applications and uses are limitless. These buildings have no borders. Which is actually a, a statement that I wrote maybe 20 years ago, but today, um, given the politics of the moment, it's, it's actually an incredibly important idea that, you know, borders, um, are invisible and have uh, a lot of heaviness that come along with them and that uh, our structures and people shouldn't necessarily be tied to those um, invisible boundaries. So diversity of material palette, design style, and transportation method are varied. Shown here, Buckminster Fuller's 
uh, Dymaxion Dome and a takeoff from 1998 of an artist named Stephen Brower and he uh, playfully came up with an idea of a kind of rethinking the trailer park using the Dymaxion car which uh, was a three a kind of precursor to the RV three-wheeled vehicle um, that didn't take its corners very well given the the location of its wheels So mobile architecture then can be defined not merely in terms of movable structures, but rather as a way of intelligently inhabiting a specific environment at a specific time and place in a way that better reacts to increasingly frequent social and environmental shifts. These fluvial forms are expressed best in the extreme sports world where surfers meld with the breaking surface or the sea becomes the form giver or the intuition and innovation of the skateboarder working off the urban infrastructure. Uh, lastly, the information age whets our appetite for the exploration of the unknown. As inquisitive social beings and innate explorers of the universe, we are standing at a new threshold of curiosity and movement. Biological and technological advancements reveal themselves in our everyday lives echoing prophecies and environmental visions from American pulp science fiction. Architecture today rolls, flows, inflates, breathes, expands, multiplies, and contracts, finally hoisting itself up as Archigram predicted at the end of the 1960s to go in search of its next user. So these images should be familiar to some of you. Um, the walking city uh, from the late 60s, early 70s, uh, Michael Webb and a group of, of um, provocative uh, thinkers based in London talking about um, the beginning of uh, uh, the end in some ways. And then um, the Cushicle, which was a kind of independently uh, driven uh, wearable piece of architecture that really uh, part of the same group um, that I oh, have always been fascinated by and had the the opportunity to, to meet with Michael Webb, who's actually still alive and lives um, outside of New York City, um, and st and some of his ideas are incredibly applicable today. Like you know, car he thought about cars that could drive into apartments and become part of the dwelling, uh, not even almost um, uh, rethinking the way that we would be living today. Where you know, I just heard today on the radio that the the L.A. Auto Show is dead because it's all about the. Um, um, electronic show now because the cars are all electronic so uh, that is really where the car manufacturers are now going so it's interesting to think about the moment that you live in uh, and look back on you know how smart you were without even knowing so I've been really thinking a lot about this for a number of years and thinking about technologies and um, you know CNC milling, rapid prototyping, 3D printing, all of these things that are ubiquitous now within our universities, but were, uh, you know, maybe two or three or even five years ago, not something that you would have seen in the design, uh, readily available in the design world. Uh, however, it's been happening like that in the automobile industry, in the aerospace industry uh, for quite a while. And so my question has always been, why is architecture so slow to catch on to what's been happening with technology. Uh, and a lot of this work is driven by some of those ideas. Ultimately, I feel, you know, that it will be embedded within our skins and, um, you know, the intelligence that we carry in our pockets right now will become smaller and smaller and be chips. And, and that almost like um, the Kushikal project from Archigram that our environments will be smarter, that we won't be just heating and cooling large, vast spaces, but it will be more about um, our bodies and how our bodies respond to, or how space responds to our bodies. Uh, I do a lot of thinking and uh, playing around with ideas, but it's really important to me that I build what I talk about as well. Um, there's an incredible history of uh, mobile architecture and, um, you know, dating back to nomadic dwellers, uh, Native Americans, you know, any species of human being has, has ha started in a kind of nomadic environment and has been progressively moving forward. Uh, I was mentioning to one of your professors that 
when I first started a lot of this work, it was not a popular topic in architecture. It was sort of, you know, why I was, I was kind of questioned, I remember, from some of my teachers. Um, and there was a moment when Frank Airy came to speak at, uh, or was on a jury when I was at SciArc, and he had said to one of the students that was presenting, you know, the, pro the problem with your generation is that none of you are interested in making monuments. And I thought about that, and I thought, yeah, that's probably true, and that's probably the direction I'm going to take. This is a recent project I just completed uh, for the Art and Design Museum in Los Angeles. It uh, is a rethinking of the Barbie pop-up trailer uh, at full scale, Barbie scale. Uh, and it was a um, kind of thinking a lot about my what inspired me in my childhood. Uh, you know, I grew up in New Hampshire, I grew up in the woods, and so we were constantly moving things around and making spaces, but there was always um, some kind of a character that was involved in, in those dwellings. And so I um, was really excited to have this opportunity to kind of rethink the shelter that Barbie might inhabit in 2015. Uh, and then a little nod to Wally Byman and uh, the students that have been working on rethinking the Airstream. It's something that I've been fascinated with as well. Uh, and this was a project that was conceptualized for our local radio station, KCRW, which is an amazing station in Los Angeles. Uh, they were wanting to do a mobile sound stage, and so I was coming up with a skin that would actually be responsive on the outside. So if someone was inside recording or speaking, you would uh, be able to visualize or see um, the change. I don't know how clear that is, yeah. You could actually see. Um, the sound that uh, was emanating or through the skin of the building so that uh, the building was also responsive to, uh, to the space, or the space responsive to the need. This project, uh, I'm just going to show you a bunch of conceptual ideas. This was done for the uh, Cooper Hewitt Museum, and uh, they had asked me to rethink the uh, the Globe Theater, Shakespeare's Globe Theater, and of course I couldn't resist uh, taking on that as a trailer and kind of offering this idea that something could be uh, easily manipulated, manipulated and open up onto the road with uh, pneumatic pods that would pop out of the back of it to become changing rooms or uh, ticket sales and fully uh, integrated with PV panels, uh, so it could you know easily go to Burning Man or you know whatever is the newest event that's going to be happening um, in your lives, uh, and something that I think is actually super doable uh, today. I look back as much as I look forward. Uh, this project was by Claude Prouvé, which, who's the son of Jean Prouvé, and it was built between the 72 and 74 um, in, outside of France, and it was 60 units of a prefabricated housing structure. It was then dismantled, uh, unfortunately. Uh, but I've always been interested in this idea. Uh, and this project at the same time, 1972, the Nakajin Capsule Hotel, this is in by Kirakawa in Tokyo. This was also dismantled, but the same concept, someone like Moshe Safdi also um, played around with these ideas for habitat. Same time period, very interesting, very rich moment in history, the kind of early 70s, um, even where a lot of people in, without knowledge necessarily that they were all doing it were playing around with these, um, these concepts of kind of smaller pieces that could be made off-site and then stacked and um, uh, much more affordable, much more efficient way to build. So I've taken on that idea for a project I'm doing right now in Seoul, Korea. It's kind of hard to see that one. Uh, but I've added a kind of new twist to it. So it's you, the adaptive reuse of shipping containers stacked. Uh, this company does uh, imports extreme sports goods. Uh, but I, it was important for me that the building uh, could operate on many levels. So this building has pieces of it that can be peeled off and move around the city, uh, almost like a pop-up retail situation where 
you know, what's happening with the food trucks right now in, in, the, um, in Los Angeles and around the country where you just, you know where the truck is because, you know, it's on your feed and this same thing would happen where you know where a new event is happening or where the store is taking place around your city because you're, you're getting some kind of communication and then people are gathering in those locations. You're no longer going to a brick and mortar location. And these are the elements that make that up. Because I do so much traveling, I'm always fascinated by airports and uh, scissor lifts and jetways. And I just think that that whole collection of utilitarian um, items are you know, a great way for architects and designers to uh, you know, deal with this, these ideas of adaptive reuse in a kind of mobile economy. So this is kind of where we're at right now with the building, just kind of looking at the section, what's public, what's private, what would be coming out of it, and what would be, uh, how, how to make it sort of, how does, how does it work? It's really the question. Uh, it was in some ways an inspiration for a project I just finished uh, for an exhibition called Architecture that was at Koneko Museum, which is in Omaha, Nebraska. June Koneko, who's a fantastic ceramicist, uh, who studied in Los Angeles and then went back to Omaha and bought up almost every building in downtown Omaha and converted those into his art studio. If you haven't seen his work, it's just phenomenal. And he funds this museum uh, where about four or five of us were asked to come in and, and do pieces that had to do with mobility. And since I was thinking about the way that this project in Korea would work, this was a great venue for me to try out a kind of smaller piece. Uh, th so this little electric truck has something called a ULD sitting on its back. And I put a little scissor lift on it, a vehicle, this electric vehicle then can pop up and become a uh, retail space uh, as needed. Uh, these unit load devices, in case you haven't seen these, these are what go inside the underbelly of any aircraft. And this is where your luggage is stored. That's why they have these kind of odd shapes. Um, and it just turns out that the manufacturer of those is in my backyard in Los Angeles. So I had. Uh, the good fortune of, of getting a kind of number of these these devices given to me so I could play around with them, much like the, um, the Airstream project you guys have been doing. Um, this then went on tour, I guess, and landed at, uh, at Google, which was great. And um, they've had a kind of interest in it for a while, too. Like I said, I'm a big believer in doing it yourself. Um, fascination with trucks. Trucks, I think, are some of the most interesting designs that are out there. Dump trucks and pickup trucks and uh, mixers. I just think that you know they're kinetic. They do so many things. They're so much smarter, again, than buildings. Uh, we need to be learning from truck culture. Uh, this is my house in Venice, and I'm showing it because it, you're going to see a kind of number of iterations of this. Uh, I'm in the middle of a new project on it. This was a early morning, uh, probably about four or five or six in the morning, where I craned in a truck over the house and attached it uh, to the back and used it for a number of years as an art studio, um, which then became my daughter's art studio. <laughs> and. Uh, and then recently it was uh, taken away uh, so that I could put a, a new project in its place. Uh, and that's a little bit of kind of showing um, ideas of how you know, inexpensively and quickly you can do uh, additions to your, your building. Uh, same concept, same truck manufacturer. This was a, a project done with a group of students at Woodbury University, where I taught for about 10 years. Incredible place in Los Angeles. Um, real hands-on approach to education. Uh, all of these materials were donated, and it, we created this mobile classroom for a group in Hollywood that teaches children about the uh, nature and kind of the life of a tree. So uh, this was built out in about 15, 12 to 15 weeks with recycled materials from uh, film sets 
because there's a, a lot of waste in the film industry, I'll tell you. And, uh, and then they, you know, are often will just give it to you if you ask them politely. And on the heels of that, another design build project, again with a group of students, that is taking an old manufactured home or trailer and converting that into another type of classroom, uh, one that teaches people about construction technology so that you can practice something and rip it out and practice it and rip it out. Um, all of the materials are meant to be exposed so you can see the joints, you can see the connections. One of my favorite parts of this project are, is the flooring, which was a bunch of old carpet tiles that we had gotten and we decided to turn them upside down so the rubber faced up. And which just made for a, you know, a better looking surface, but also a kind of understanding that materials have two sides. Shipping containers, for some reason, I have, I definitely have a kind of reputation as the hot dog girl, but I also have a reputation as a shipping container person because I get so many requests for this kind of construction, probably because of this house that I did for the owner of the brewery at the artist loft where I worked and lived for many years. Um, and it's made up of materials that were all found on his property. Uh, he was actually the supplier of a lot of these trucks that you saw before as well. So it's good to be friends with your landlord. Uh, this is made from four shipping containers and two grain trailers and a bunch of other found items. The site is... Um, it's about 10,000 square feet. It sits across the street from the brewery, which is in the lower part of the screen. Um, the house itself sits at the back of the property, uh, which every good Angelino drives to work, which uh, this guy does as well. So he walks the property, gets in his car, and drives across the street. Makes sense to me. But it was really important that you know, that he had that moment of uh, a kind of a natural experience. And as we removed some of the, the concrete and the tarmac from the site, it, it exposed the alluvial plain of, of the LA River, which it's not too far from the LA River, which is a very, um, uh, you know, there, it's just, it attracts all kinds of uh, migratory birds and uh, butterflies and egrets, and so it was a uh, pretty, and he created this pond as well, so it didn't just pop up, um, but it really um, kind of thrives in this uh, in its setting. And then all of the materials that you see on the right-hand side w was the boneyard, essentially, that we s salvaged all of those materials from. You can see the containers here, uh, one's aluminum and one is steel. There's a waterfall that um, acts to churn the water in the grain trailer, which is a koi fish pond. And as some of you might know, koi fish don't have stomachs so that they're constantly, anything that's coming in is going out really quickly, so there's a kind of aroma, and you want to constantly be moving the water in this place. He spends a lot of time in the tropics, so he likes that. Um, and then there's a guy here in the lower right-hand corner. I don't know if you're familiar. His name is David Makarski. He's the head of the um, industrial design department, I believe, at Art Center in Pasadena. And he's also a resident at the brewery. And he did all of the furniture for the house. So everyone, it was a really gratifying project because everyone that lived and worked in this colony also worked on this house. And it happened in a three-month period. Um, so... That's not typically what I do. I only occasionally work with shipping containers. Mostly I work with uh, modular construction and steel construction. Um, and for you know the students out there who are wondering how do you get started in your practice or your, your life, um, you know, you meet someone in publishing that helps a lot and then they publish your project and that's what happened to me. And this image was published first in Dwell and um, I didn't really have a plan for how to build it. I just knew I was interested in creating um, and rethinking trailers and rethinking modular buildings and turning them into residential structures. And when I created these images and they were published, I had a lot of people calling and asking how to buy it. And that's how I taught myself how to communicate with um, the manufacturing, uh, the world of 
uh, of trailer manufacturers, which is a small world, but it's a hard world to break into, I'll tell you. Uh, but I was really thinking about this, the system that they worked with, but how do I change the materials? How do you kind of change the mentality within the, the system, which is uh, not an easy thing to do, as it turns out. So this question that I'm posing, or that Buckminster Fuller poses of, Madam, do you know the weight of your house, is a question that has become um, an, a very important uh, piece of what I do because everything I do has to move and it has to fit down the road um, and typically in California the greatest width you can the maximum width you can move a single module is 16 feet um, I'm sure you see that out here on your freeways as well highways um, and then you get up to 70 or 80 feet in length uh, with about a 15 foot or 15 and a half foot height uh, and it's all about like I said, getting it down the road, moving it off of a barge, and uh, when that becomes the de the definition of of um, the building components, it changes the game. The process this morning is we're going to first set up the crane on the street, at 6 a.m. to 7 a.m. TV, I can't. <laughs> but you know, drones are where it's at. In case you haven't, don't know that. Wait a minute. Um. So that was that's a project I'm in the middle of right now. 
you can't go wrong when you install your house in a day. It was 15 minutes per module. The neighbors don't hate you, you know, everyone, except for the, the street being blocked off for a few hours. You know, other than that, it's pretty magical experience when you have, you realize that you can do things much more efficient, much uh, less expensive, and still maintain design. So those three, you know, those areas of money, design, um, and time, if you can make the three of those things work together, then it's a kind of golden triangle. Uh, I also realized that I was kind of influenced by Corbusier in this project, which I didn't even realize. Uh, this is a pretty famous building in the architecture world. And uh, when I started working on these modules and thinking about this stair system, um, I didn't know that so much of that had seeped into my head. Uh, so th the project, when you come to Venice to visit, uh, will be on show. Uh, it's we're probably like three weeks away from from completion, and it's uh, it's an idea about vertic verticality and how we can work um, in tighter urban contexts and bring in kind of smaller units to densify our cities. Um, a couple other examples I'm going to show you of kind of smaller, more modular buildings that I um, have created and built for different clients. This one um, is a 12 foot by 60 foot module that uh, acted as a show house. Uh, the other thing I found out in my industry that it's very important to have something that people can walk into and, and touch and feel the environment um, in order for it to be convincing. Uh, I'm sure Wally, Wally Byman went through the same thing. Uh, he was a little bit more successful, he sold a lot more, but I'm getting there. So this, this idea uh, shows you that within a small volume, a 12 foot space, you know, if you have a 12, 12 foot wide space, but you have a 12 foot high ceiling, you get a lot of natural light. If you use a kind of polycarbonate panel on your wall, you know, you, you get insulated. Um, space, but you also feel like you're in a much bigger space. So it doesn't really take too much to change um, what has been an industry that really hasn't changed much in quite a while. That project was bought by uh, a film producer, of course, and brought up to Joshua Tree on an 80-acre parcel where he's been collecting architecture, um, not a bad thing to do, and he uses it now as a as, I don't even know what he uses it as a retreat, I suppose, from his other retreats. Uh, it's kind of, it's a good life, Hollywood. Um, this project is uh, four modules, so I use physical models. Uh, I still build models in my office to show people how things come together. I still think that that is one of the best ways for um, the layperson to understand space. Uh, this shows a building that's on a relatively small lot in Santa Monica. It's um, 16 foot wide modules, like I mentioned before. Maximum width, you can go down the road. Uh, and each one is built from a steel frame. It's a steel moment frame chassis. And then the infill of the walls can be essentially whatever you want. Typically, it's wood stud. This house came in. Um, needed two cranes to be put into place because there were so many um, electrical wires in that area. So it was a little bit of a kind of choreography between cranes, which was pretty interesting and came together in about a three month period. Um, the finishes on this project, some of it was done on site, some of it was done in the factory. The upper level is a uh, uh, a cement board that was painted, and the bottom level is a stucco. Um, you can do a lot in the factory. I definitely recommend the more in the factory, the better. Uh, you have a lot more control, and things happen a lot more efficiently than they happen on a construction site. Uh, and then the inside of the building, this is a house that the, the client's pretty happy with. She now has, I think, three kids living in this house. Um, this is a competition that I'm just finished yesterday, last night actually, and just sent it out. And it's for um, it's my hometown of Peterborough, New Hampshire. And there's an amazing artist colony called the McDowell Colony. I highly recommend that to any uh, aspiring artists that are moving up in the world, uh, where they give you a housing and a place to 
think and work for up to three months. And they came to me and asked me to participate in kind of rethinking a park and farmer's market for the town. So that was pretty exciting. And I had to go back to my shipping container routes and kind of think about how I could do something that was a little bit more New England, um, but also kind of using the same principles of um, kind of reclaimed lumber, uh, photovoltaics, and shipping containers that get used uh, in this farmer's market where you can host um, a variety of different pop-up shops as well. So I've, there's a long text that goes along with this. And part of it also is a theater space and, and uh, performance space. Uh, I, I was really lucky to work with an amazing landscape firm as well. And um, you know we're hoping. We're just hoping we win. Um, I'm also working with SIP panels, structurally insulated panels, which uh, came about when I was uh, a Loeb Fellow at Harvard and um, had been asked by Dwell Magazine to come up with a new idea for a, a competition for a prefab home. And I started thinking about what would happen if you had um, sites that were harder to get at, or you wanted to kind of quickly put together a kit of parts that could inter be interchangeable. So this is called the Swell House, um, and it uses steel and the SIPs together. And this was the image that was published in Dwell at that time. Um, the good news was that somebody liked it and bought it, and we built it. Uh, using this system, SIPs are structurally insulated panels. Um, really, they come with different types of infills. Uh, some of them are wheat and straw. This is a styrofoam. Really great if you um, have sensitivity to sound. So this client is a film. Uh, I'm sorry, is a um, uh, music producer. He produced um, Bob Dylan's last album here in his house, and he has a recording studio, so he really wanted to be able to control sound, and they're also great for insulation. Um, the, the SIPs went in in two days, I believe, and then the rest of the house took about 10 months. But you know, the idea is that the, the bones of it were pretty quick. Um, it's kind of a big open space. And again, the SIPs um, come pre-channeled for your electrical and essentially snap together and in a relatively short period of time. What I liked about that project is it's led me to Taliesin, which is the Frank Lloyd Wright's School of Architecture. That's this one is based in Scottsdale, Arizona. He also has one in Wisconsin or had he is was, but you know, their school still exists. It's also in Wisconsin where the students travel back and forth every six months, um, an amazing education, and they build their own shelter in the desert or back in Wisconsin. This was a design-built studio I did with these students, and it was the first new structure that has been built at Taliesin since the death of Mr. Wright, so it was very controversial, and we were pushed off to the edge, but, which was fine, and um, we were pretty happy with that. And we, we used a system of the SIPs and this kind of modular steel building, and we created um, a, a small retreat space with a, a breezeway that uh, passes through it. Um, we left the SIPs pretty much as they were and just gave them coated them and gave them some paint. Uh, this building also is meant to be off the grid and, uh, like I said, lives over on the corner of Taliesin. And you can visit it on the tour if you ask them to see it. Um, I'm not sure if you can stay there. I think they usually let their artists and residents stay there. And it sits over a wash, and which is what we liked about it, that ultimately it was just cantilevered um, over the desert floor. That's the end. Can I take questions? I'm sorry, I feel like I was just rushing through it it's a little bit jet laggy. I'm ready for a beer. <laughs> Honestly. Yes? Mm 
<laughs> yeah, I mean, that's a really interesting question. I mean, some of the criticism about, you know, hardcore modernism, like a Mies van der Rohe building, is that, you know, it's very austere and it doesn't have a lot of, you know, gentle softness to it. Um, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I mean, you, so just to respond to that, I mean, you could walk down the aisle of Home Depot and look at all the building materials in there and say none of that is very human-esque, you know, but it's really what you do with it. So it's what you do with the two by four. It's what you do with the SIP panel or the shipping container. It's how you finish it. It's how you, you know, it, um, exfoliate its skin. It's how, you know, it's what you as the designer brings to it, it's the natural light. It's taking something out of context and kind of repurposing it for another use. And I think that's really what a lot of this work is about. How do you just take something like, um, you know, a cement mixer and kind of make it into a room? I've seen, um, there's a great firm in New York called Low Tech and they did a great project like that. So, you know, it's, I think we're so trained often to kind of look in our industry at the kind of materials and the ideas within our industry, but as artists or architects, we need to look outside of our industry to invent, you know, like Steve Jobs wasn't looking at, well, I don't know what he was looking at. I shouldn't speak for him. I don't know. Any other questions I saw? Yes. Well, so, I mean, I'm sure here you don't have building codes. It's super easy to do everything. But um, my advice often is, as especially, you know, as a student, is that you just do it. I, I always say, you know, it's much easier to ask for, for forgiveness than to ask for permission. So sometimes you get an amazing client who says, you know, I don't really... I know enough, I'm responsible. He was the GC on the project. You know, he knows how to build. He's like, I'm, I'm gonna take full responsibility. You just conceive of this and, you know, I'll make it work. Um, I think that's often the way it works in most in construction industry. It's, everyone's inventing it all the time. You know, if it's, if it's new, Frank Gehry, when he did Disney Concert Hall, they couldn't build it or they, they over cost, they, you know, they said the cost was so extravagant because they had never built something like that before. He figured out a way to make it affordable. You know, it wasn't hard. I mean, it was hard, but, you know, he did, he figured that out, you know. So I, I guess, um, I'm not saying to, you know, to do illegal things. I'm just saying that, you know, to really challenge yourself and to challenge norms you have to try things that are that are alternative he did actually get in trouble a little bit but um he called it uh <laughs> he had some crazy term for it he said that it was like a caretaker's house on you know a piece of um industrial or not it, it was a um, agricultural land and it was like the caretaker's house for the agricultural land so that works for me. Yes? Yeah, that's a really, I mean, that's interesting because we're actually casting right now for a TV show, everybody, um, to uh, to do a, a new show on mobile architecture. Uh, and probably three or four years ago, when this idea first went out there, the per the TV people said, "Oh, America is not ready for this idea. You know, they will not stomach that." And now, tiny houses have you know become. The, the talk of the day. You know, I, 
I always go back to this feeling of like, look outside of the way everybody else is building. You know, like the, those ULDs, those unit load devices that I was so fascinated by just by being in the airports all the time. You know, finding a way to go into their world and then just pulling that thing out. You know, I had an instant uh, structure. You know, you could easily deploy those in so many different ways. Um, you know, I think I've seen some of the shows about the tiny houses, and, you know, it's always about this kind of real minutia and intricacy, intricacy of the detailing, and, like, someone just slaved on this for 12 months, you know, in their back in someone's field. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be that complicated. Uh, Muji, you know, Muji, the Japanese company, just came out with a new uh, Muji house. It's very uh, clean. It's very simple. You know, I think that there's all kinds of ways to think about design, and um, it doesn't have to be overly complex. And sometimes, you know, like the paper clip, I think, is one of the most interesting designs out there. And, you know, someone did pretty well with that. Um, so it's not, it's not complexity. You know, it's simplicity. But it's finding the right formula. Yes. <laughs> Such a big conversation, you know, like how do you deal with refugee housing? How do you deal with the homeless population? How do you deal with, you know, affordability? How do students afford housing? You know, I, I'm a big, this is a kind of segue, but I'm a huge fan of trailer parks. Like why aren't we rethinking trailer parks so that you're a student, you come to school, you buy your trailer, you buy your unit, you know, you, you, you rent that, that space for the time that you're at school and then you take your house with you or you resell it to the next person and that there's a, you know, again, Archigram came up with this idea of plug-in city. It's not a new idea. RV parks are essentially that, but it's, a, it's just bloated. So I know that's not your question. Um, <laughs> I, I don't have the answer to that. I mean, clearly, otherwise I would have done it. It's hugely challenging because you're dealing with pol you know political borders and you're deal and with public space you know i've had this idea for like a kind of land airbnb that there's all of this empty land why don't we just let people lease it out and you can you know rent your your portable pod and and stick it in there and then you know all of this land that's kind of unused in cities or in, in around the world can be um Someone can make money off of it, and it can be habitable. So for me, one of the challenges is uh, private property. You know, it's um, how, how do you deal with that? You know, we're, we're pretty stuck. Uh, I don't know. LA is having a huge crisis right now with um, its homeless population. I mean, it's just, and, you know, the winter's coming, and no, one's, no one knows what to do. I don't know. You can solve it. I mean, you guys can solve it. That's your that's your generation's task. Yes. Mm-hmm. And sh you said Shigeru Bond, that, that one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Yeah.
Yeah, I, I mean, I've, I, I'm going to guess you're kind of in your 20s, somewhere around there, something like that. So um, I know I'm not supposed to ask that in my school. But, um, you know, something happens when you're like in your teens and 20s and you don't have very much stuff in your backpack and you have, you know, your thumb drive or whatever you have. And then you get older and you have kids and then all of a sudden you have stuff. Like anybody who has a baby realizes, oh, my God, there's so much stuff. So, you know, I used to think we could just store our memories on our hard drives that, you know, we don't need all grandmother's attic to store our stuff in. But there is a time in life where people are stuck with this idea of ownership, you know, and and and, and then you need a house to put all that stuff in. Um, you know, how there's certain cultures, I mean, I think a more Japanese aesthetic, which is more about a minimalist, you know, aesthetic where you kind of things have multi-purpose or multi-use or, you know, even the shakers, you know, like you could put, you would hang your chairs on your wall, you know, and that there were a lot of different um, ways to inhabit space and, and goods. You know, it's, it's time for a radical shifting of our, of, the nature and the and these McMansions and the way that we're we're living, I think that you know it's it's changing. I, I definitely think that the shared economy is thing is changing things. I think that people are thinking about you know co coing in a lot of different ways. Um, but then what happens when you start to have a family? You know how will you will you choose to live in a tent? You know in in off the grid, or you know are you going to sort of get that corporate job and, you know, make that bacon. So I, I'm not, you know, I, I don't know what's happening with America, it, but I know I'm interested in this and I try to kind of live it as much as I can. And I know that there's other people that are interested in it. And I think that we will be seeing a shift definitely in the way we make things in the, la in the next five years. You know, er you can 3D print anything now. It's like, you know, you don't need an architect. <laughs> That's great. Thank you all so much for coming. I really enjoyed that. Great questions. Thank you.